Welcome to Magicians Talking Magic. If you're wondering why my voice is not as bassy and soulful as it normally is, that's because my name is not Ryan Joyce. My name is Matt Zat. And my name is Grimazing. Thank you so much for tuning in to yet another special guest host episode of Magicians Talking Magic. Matt, triple snaps to you for joining in, pulling in the guest host spot on today's episode. Oh, thank you. Can I, I hope this mic can pick up my nice snapping, my nice new mic. <laughs> I, and also, I appreciate the Rocco's Modern Life shirt that's going on, too. Yeah, thank you very much. Nobody ever gets this. I bought this shirt, and I thought so many people would get it, and I, I guess I just wasn't with the right people, but uh, you got it immediately. <laughs> um, I do apologize this episode. There might be a ton of cameos from, um, you know, third co-host of the podcast, Luca, barking in the background. We do have a maintenance guy <laughs> at the house this morning as we record. But, you know, we record as we do. And before we dive into this week's topic of the week, making your marketing more authentic, which, Matt, such a pleasure to have you here to talk all about Thank this. Thank you very much. I'm happy to do it. We're going to chat news as we do. First of all, the book club, we, I have a big book club update. We still haven't recorded <laughs> our plots, ploys, and other cons. The, I feel like we've all been busy with vacation, um, maybe shows, magic shows have been busy. So that book club is still yet to be recorded. If you still want to get in on this, join the Discord uh, and stay tuned for whatever miraculous date we come up with to record the book club. Also, you can watch these episodes of Magicians Talking Magic on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe because you might be watching this episode right now. And if you are... Triple snaps to you. <laughs> uh, Matt Zat, do you have any updates for yourself? Anything personal or anything maybe like coming from the pipelines of Vanishing Ink? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to turn this into a, uh, a shameless promo for Vanishing Ink because I don't know if anyone, if no one really knows who I am. It's, it's not shocking. Uh, but I do work at, a, I work at Vanishing Ink. I'm a manager over there. I do pretty much a, a little bit of everything over there. If you've emailed us, you've probably seen an email from me or things like that. But the most exciting thing is probably uh, is Magi Fest coming up in September, and we're we're you know it's it's been an interesting situation, but we're still trying to get through and and get a nice safe event for everyone. I think it'll be it'll be nice. Everyone will be safely enjoying and getting some magic back into our lives, which we're we're super excited about. And we got some big some big releases like, but uh, you know I'll let I'll let everyone uh, get those emails or get those social media. I'm not going to turn. MTM, you know, we shorten it here. I'm not going to turn MTM into a uh, a vanishing ink promo spot, but yeah, just keep an eye out. You will, uh, you'll definitely hear about it uh, on that front, and also um some other cool stuff. Uh, this I will give a shout out out. Uh, I know we uh, we were chatting about this before. There's a very cool, very very cool new app out. We'll have to get you on there. We'll have to get Gray Amazing on there. But there is a, a new app out called the Clava app. Uh, and I'm not like sponsored by it or anything, but I've done a few shows on it. It's pretty cool. What they're trying to do is basically cut out all those uh, all those subscriber limits and those things where you want to get where you have to get monetized on Instagram and YouTube and things like that, and get you paid right away. So basically, the simple, most basic format of it is you go live, however many people come. Uh, join. It could be from anywhere around the world. You get paid for that. So, uh, you know, you can always reach out to me, reach out to Graham. We can get you in touch with the right people if you want to do that. Like I said, it's a it's a pretty cool thing. And that's that's it for my own personal life. Virtual that's shows are are uh, are picking up again, which is fun. Um, you, I I would imagine you're having a lot. You know what? I just actually performed a virtual show again yesterday too. I felt. I just started getting some in-person gigs, and then mm -hmm. oh, here's a virtual show again. I'm like oh, oh, I got to set that up again real quick. Hold on, hold on. And I know, I know. A while back, you were talking about those those in-person gigs, and you were a little nervous going back. And uh, how'd they go? I just I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. I want to know what it felt like because I know for me, the first one I did was I felt like I had never performed magic in my life. I felt so rusty, which was amazing because I'm like, I just did hundreds of these virtual shows and I'm, I'm performing every time but it felt like i if it took like at least 30 minutes for the rust to wear off for me i really want to kayfabe this answer and tell you how it went but i haven't performed in person yet as we're recording this i perform for the first time next week oh boy so i have two coming up so i still have those those jitters and i'm nervous and i have you know i'm still in that realm of planning too many sets and tricks for what everyone's comfortable with. And then you'll get there and you'll you'll do the same three and then switch to the next three and then we'll just keep going. Is it now this is a stand up show, right? One is a stand up, so I'm doing, you know, a fifteen minute spot on a variety comedy show. And then the other one is I'm doing walk around magic at a brewery. <laughs> 
Well, that'll be that'll be a ton of fun. Like I said, it is like riding a bike. I won't lie. Let me. I don't want to be dramatic. I don't want to be here on MTM being dramatic. It is <laughs> like riding a bike. But I, I will not lie. I had not been that nervous in a long time. And it was uh, it was a good feeling. It's kind of one of those feelings that reminds you of why you do it. Those feelings, those nerves, those that adrenaline rush. I kind of I kind of missed it. I won't lie. Did you change up your material at all, or were were you fi- finding you were full contact? Because I when I do close up yeah. magic, I do a lot of taps on the shoulders and things like this, right, to keep people engaged and focused. How did you find you were presenting your magic? Yeah, that's one hundred. I'm the exact same way. I'm the touch the arm, touch the shoulder, get people. I did not do that as much. I also. Uh, I wouldn't say I changed up too much of my material. I didn't do a lot of in the hand stuff, but I wasn't too gun shy about, but I will say I kind of leaned into it. As soon as I walked up to a table, you know, you were talking about this a couple episodes back about connecting with people. I would just break the ice immediately. And we were talking about be like, Hey, just in case anyone's uncomfortable, I would break out the hand sanitizer. I actually used hand sanitizer as the way of removing the X for double cross and let them do it to themselves as well. So it was kind of part of the bit. So I leaned into it. Uh, I wasn't doing sponge balls. I also see a lot of people uh, still doing card to mouth and card in mouth. That is as I just want to just preface that I was a germaphobe before it was cool. Um, (laughs) And there's no way that I would do a card to mouth right now. I just, I could not even fathom doing that and then handing it to somebody. I'm not judging anyone. Please feel free to do it. That's just me. I would be terrified. So other than that, I didn't really, change it up too much but i did keep distance wasn't touching shoulders and little things but not as much as you would think i i understand where did you find when you had the hand sanitizer there were people using it did was it a common thing that we before we do a card trick let's do a little sanitize pick a card oh yeah absolutely it was more after it was more after i put it there i said you know if you i'm gonna have people help me if you want this this is here feel free to use it before use it after and i, I think like it kind of disarmed people it also helped that most of the events i've done have been uh, have some sort of protocol or requirement in for people they were all private events so it wasn't just free roaming where people weren't too sure so that did help a little bit but um yeah i would say it was disarming to people and they they weren't and there, there was people who clearly didn't want to do anything you know just like with any before COVID happened, you just read the room and you know, let's not force the issue here. Uh, Magi Fest, I do want to pick your brain a little bit of it because the climate of what events are, are like is changing rapidly back and forth, back and forth. Who knows what's up? Um, when it comes to Magi Fest, is there, a, is there a hybrid solution for Magi Fest for people like, say, Canadians that maybe can't get down there to tune yes. into some of this awesome stuff? So that is a, that is a, it's a, a tough topic to talk about. I mean, I am, have been leading that, that charge and, and handling it as part of the support wizards there. And it's a, it's a <laughs> tough thing. So there, there will be no hybrid solution, unfortunately. And it's mostly because trying to put together the hybrid solution turned into being a challenge that wasn't going to be, you weren't going to get a high quality product. And if you've watched Masterclass Live or Vanishing Ink Showtime, you've, you've gotten very familiar with a a high quality product and to charge a premium price or charge this and do that and it's it's a it's a terrible product you can't follow it things like that we just didn't want to do it so actually the hybrid option was was taken away um was taken away a few months back when we realized that it just was not going to be the quality that it could be uh but like i mentioned before now that it's all in person you know we are doing it we've capped the attendance we have covid protocols in place we're we're distancing we're we're moving some things outside so we're trying our best. I mean, I mean, we, you can't beat around the bush. This year's Magic Fest is going to be different than any other, but we're doing everything we can to make sure it's as safe and fun as possible. And, you know, hopefully by the time we get around to, to next year's, everything's sort of normalized. But, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't turn the other way to it. That's what I want to say. You can't just turn your head and expect a thousand people to show up and be like, okay, everything's going to be fine. We just couldn't do that. So that's why we had to put some uh, some different protocols in place. And all that is, if you go to magifest.org, everything you need is there. There's still some tickets left if you if you want to grab them. And um, I think it'll be a good time. I'm, I'm real excited for it. For the people, the lucky people that get to go and everything, is it going to yeah. be like your regular Magi Fest with fun surprises um, and unexpected things as per yes, usual? Yes, of course. It'll, it'll always be. We have some, we have, I mean, the lineup is just absolutely crazy. And it's, we have, we have 10 different shows to kind of spread things out and, and not uh, have one big show where everyone's seeing everything at once. So it's all, it's going to be 
spread out so people can go see what they want. The lineup is absolutely stacked. There's always, always going to be some surprises. We're going to announce some surprises about upcoming Magi Fest, which are going to be super cool. We have a, we have a real awesome uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek hoodie that we're going to have. And obviously there's, there's some things I can't talk about, but it, it will be a good time. And we, we knew, we knew it was going to be tough for the people who can't make it. And we're really sad about that, but we're doing everything we can for the people who can be there. And we will make sure for all the people who, uh, who couldn't make it, we will make it up for you at the next one. There's some really, really, really cool stuff for when uh, Magi Fest is back to full capacity. Magi Fest was my first magic convention experience ever. And it was mind blowing. And the year I went, was Paul Daniels. And how, what year was that? I know it was in the recent-ish, but I, what exact year was that? Ooh, I can't, I'm not good with that sort of stuff. It was the Paul Daniels year. That's how I just So a pivotal it. moment in your magic career, your first magic convention, and the year is, is slip in the mind. Hey, Matt, live in the moment, right? Live in the moment. Very fair. <laughs> Very fair. This is called covering up because I can't remember the year off the top of my head. <laughs> Do you remember your first Magi Fest experience? You want to know what it was? Yeah, or when or who? Last sure. year. Really? <laughs> Last year. I grew up, when I grew up, um, I, you know, my parents weren't not supportive, but they weren't sending me out to magic conventions and things like that. And I actually gave up on magic for about 10 years of my life. So yeah, my first Magi Fest was 2020. And was it this was- your first convention experience too? That was my first convention experience, yep. Wow. I mean, I know all about them. I know what's happened. Working at Vision Inc. I've learned about all the upcoming and the past ones. But my first personal one that I was at for you know all three days and there, I've been to smaller ones. There's like local ones in Connecticut where I grew up and stuff. But the first one was Magi Fest last year. And it was like, where have I been all my life? <laughs> I'm so excited to be able to meet up with you at a Magi Fest in the future. That's going to be so awesome. Absolutely. I know. We've uh, we've only lived in this virtual world. I, I can't wait. There's a lot of people that I've... It's crazy because when I do virtual shows, I'm sure anyone who's done a virtual show has run into this. We have been in this for so long that when you do like a show for a company, you're sometimes people are calling me and they're like, can you do a new hire event? Because all of our new hires have never met each other or, or their friends or their coworkers or things like that. And it's like that with Magic. I've met so many people over the past year and I'm like, man, I talk to these people all the time. It's like the coolest thing about the community, the Discord. You talk to these people all the time. I'm like, wait, I've never met these people in real life. In IRL, it's only it's only on only online, so I can't wait. There's a lot of people I'm excited to meet, and we'll get through it. We're gonna get to some fun stuff. We'll all meet. We'll all have fun. It's all gonna be good. Positive energy. And hopefully, the listeners were listening there, but you just threw a, a golden frisbee of info right there. Doing a new team member event for a company that is actually super key because so many companies have hired new members, and most people have not even had that. Meet like the water cooler chats and everything, but we're going to be getting into all that because let's Absolutely. dive into the topic of the week. Let's dive into the topic of the week, making your marketing more authentic. Today, we're going to have a high level chat, bump the magical volleyball back and forth about being more authentic in your marketing and why that is oh so important. So Matt, um, let's start off with why being authentic in marketing is so important. I think also, by the way, this is going to be a unique conversation with both of us because if you're a listener of the podcast, we know what you do at Vanishing Inc. Mm -hmm. um, you're kind of, you help with the customer experience, the marketing, the emails, reviews, so much of the authenticity behind Vanishing Inc. And I myself, I have a huge background in marketing and advertising and everything like this. So I think we will have a good conversation here. But let's start off with why is authentic, being authentic so important, Matt? Yeah, I, I think that's a great example. And I can actually use Vanishing Ink in that and also myself. But I think just what people don't realize is that people with magic, they they want to know you and understand you. They don't, they don't care as much about the tricks you do. Because if you think about it, I, I feel like everyone's had this experience. You go, you go out, you do your first magic trick. It goes great. And people are like, oh, that's better than, that's better than David Copperfield. You know, they, they don't care what the trick is, how great the trick is. What they care about is, you know, you're entertaining them. And they want to understand you because you do something so cool and so unique. And you have such a unique perspective on things. And people want to get to, to you know to know that person behind you. And I think that that is a big thing and a big push at Vanishing Inc. and something I've been very 
supported behind and have pushed behind on the social media and the marketing is that understanding that you know people like Josh and Annie they know they know them well they want to be able to experience them if you email us you might get an email right back from them they're on there they're not we don't hide behind the idea of uh of being of being a faceless entity i think that we have a chance to show you know we are here we are human here is how we can help you you covered a lot you covered a lot of it right there um, but I think the biggest thing is that people really want to get to know you, right? They really want to mm -hmm. dive in and know more about you. I've been getting a lot recently because it, I'm on the local news. I have an, I have an inside connection <laughs> uh, from my past work life, but I'm on the local news a lot. So I now get my bookings most frequently from, hey, I saw you on TV and I'd love to have you come to the office and share you with everyone. And I started to also recognize, too, the character that I've developed, this amazing level seven wizard thing. That I play into that on the phone too, as I answer the phone, because that person wants that same experience kind of through the phone conversation. But then I'll also, you know, pull the curtain back and let's have a real, I'm a real person. Yeah. You know, and I think you, you, you touched on it perfectly because you, uh, you've mentioned it like gray amazing is a character, but you live that character. It's not just something you turn on when you're doing a show. It's something that you understand and everything you build, every part of your marketing, every part of your trick is through that character. And when it's authentic like that, people are going to see that as opposed to if you are just doing things just for a marketing sake and it doesn't come off as authentic. I think people are are, are, are very understanding. They, they recognize that they're going to be smart to something like that if you're, if you're not being genuine to yourself or your character. I think a good thing to relate this to um, we all know like a mechanic, an electrician, a plumber. I have a mate. There's a maintenance person here in the house today. We know, I mean, okay, this is an old school statement. You know a guy, right? It's not a guy. It's a person. You know a person, mm -hmm. right? But everyone's like, oh, I know a person that's the perfect person that can do this for me that has the hookup because you trust them. You trust what they do. Um, they are, they're a real human being and a real person. We've also, when we've had to find a new service. So recently I had to get my lawnmower. Like I, so... You know, I'm not. I hit a spike on the lawn. All right, I ruined you, it. Uh, you, you, uh, you're riding lawnmower. Or are you a push lawnmower? What are we working with here? Okay, hey, I'm not. I don't have that kind of property. It's just a push lawnmower. It's a regular, you know, gas push lawnmower. But I, I, you know, I damaged it. I had to find a repair service. So I'm on Google, and you're. I'm trying to find the place that's going to show me a picture of the person. Maybe tell me the story about the real person. I can see their facility. See what their shop looks like because there's this thing that people have maybe told you off the cuff, you know, if it's a clean shop, they're going to do a good job. If it's a dirty shop, they're not going to do a good job. However, if that dirty shop is in the country, you, you might get a good deal. You know, all these sorts of things. So you're all, that's what we have in the back of our mind. And we have to kind of think that as we're selling our magic too, that when people are looking for us, they want to see our photo. They don't want to just see a stock photo of um, a wedding. <laughs> you know, like that's not helping us out or anything like this. They want to learn about us and see that, oh, it's a real person does a real service. Um, and all these sorts of things. And I think, yeah, they just don't want like, so talk about like, I want to know, understand like, what is, how would you explain the, the gray amazing character? Cause when I go to your website, which a phenomenal website, by the way, and I go there and I see, I, I can see from just your face and the colors and the excitement of it. I understand that it's going to be, I feel like it's a fun show or relaxed show it's going to be amazing it has it has a vibrance to it but it doesn't also you know the the photos you chose and the logos you chose and the colors you chose don't also tell me that you know i can enjoy this as an adult it doesn't have to be just for kids so in your own words it's like did i did i hit it what did i miss what were you trying to get with things like that i think that's that's the goal of what i'm going for i'm kind of so maybe this is a deep dive into this too of how to get to authentic marketing and I've always been a strong believer of you have to do it yourself, DIY, because once you outsource it, you're kind of letting someone else speak for you uh, because every artist, every graphic artist puts a little bit of themselves into the work for that other person. You know, I'm always trying to express myself if I get when I would be freelanced out for, say, poster work or graphic work or, or something like that, I'd be putting a little bit of me in there. So, you knew it was my piece. Right. So now when I'm developing everything for me, um, I'm always writing in my own voice. I try to write in my own voice and I'll also rewrite this stuff a whole bunch of times too, because it doesn't make sense. And it, I also realized maybe when I first write it down, it's too deep dive grimazing character and I got to scale it back so that a corporate person who I want to book me for an event or something, when they read it, they go, ha ha funny. And not no, just too, like with, too just deep. Just like cut, with yeah. a magic trick, do you, do you have somebody 
who you can trust that can read it and knows your voice and knows that maybe you've gone too far? A hundred percent. That would be Ryan Joyce. Our... Ryan jo- <laughs> that is the, the permanent host of MTM, I believe. <laughs> I, I recognize the name. And that's, that's really crazy uh, that you mentioned that. And it's something I struggle with for sure. A hundred percent. Something that recently I've struggled with uh, is that I, I'm very open about the fact that I, uh, I do not think it should be a stigma. I have, I have ADHD. It's something I have to struggle with when I'm, when I'm writing things like that. And something like a website to me can be very overwhelming, especially when you're starting from scratch and having to learn to break it up into different pieces. So there's been times where I'm like, I just, my brain will not function. Should I outsource this? Should I go to somebody that I know that I trust that can do it? But it's the same thing. Every time I've outsourced something, they get what I'm trying to say, but it just does not feel authentic to me. I've had some friends who know me well and are able to do it, but when I've gone completely you know, off the grid and, and just gone to a fiver or something and try to get something. It just never seems to, to have that. So trying to balance that of like, this is, this is tough for me to do. How do I break it up and do it to myself? To me, is just as important because when I'm done, it'll be exactly what I wanted it to be from the start. And then maybe if there's a graphic designer who can tweak, or I know you had someone just do a great logo for you. You know, you, you have to realize that some things, there are things that you just can't do. You know, if you are not an adept video editor, you know, you can have someone, you can have someone help you with that or tweak it once you're done putting the basis of it together. So you got finding that balance of being authentic, but also recognizing, you know, some things it's okay to, to get some help on. I think when it comes to outsourcing work, treat it like a microbrewery. When you look at a microbrewery, they have killer merch, killer branding on their websites. Usually the can translates into merchandise on a hat, sticker, t-shirt, all this sorts of thing, because they usually just find an artist they like and we'll, we'll stick with that person forever. So if you are going to outsource, you want to find, and there, I mean, these people are easy to come across on Instagram if you're searching a local hashtag and an artist sort of thing like that. Mm-hmm. And that's the market. That's where, they, that's where artists sell their work and everything like this. So um, if you're outsourcing, that's a good way to do it too. And that's what I did with my logo. I found a local artist um, and I trusted his style. And I th- we spitballed back and forth a lot and I didn't know if he understood my crazy. And he got it, I think. He got it, cl- like, you know, I still, there's part of me that I see the logo and I go, I would have done it like this. Mm-hmm. But I had, I was designing it over and over again myself and I had to throw it away. But still, when it comes specifically to the website, um, this will be a future episode on MTM. Joyce and I have been talking about this, that I think as an entrepreneur, I mean, if you're scaling up huge, maybe outsource the website. But if you're a small business owner, like most magicians, it's really important to have the control of the website. For instance, when we just hit uh, pandemic season, I had just I changed all the copy. So I was writing about my virtual services and how that solves the problem for people then. But now as things are opening up, ooh, I have to add those other services back in. It's so much easier for me just to add that in and then write the copy the way I want, um, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, you made a great point because the reason my website is still so outdated is because the person who made it did a great job when they made it, but it's on a platform. It's on a very complicated WordPress uh, system that I just like have tried to learn and to modify, and it has all different parameters and things like that. So it's been so hard to upgrade that I've wanted to to rebuild from scratch. But I don't, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but actually the, you mentioned craft beer and it clicked in my head that that is such a perfect example of why it's so important to be your authentic self because craft beer is kind of like, You'll have people in the magician world who watch Fool Us or they they read a book or they like magic. They're kind of in the know. We'll call those people the heavy beer drinkers. Those are the people that are going (laughs) to go up to a beer and they're going to read the little description below it. They're going to read about the hops. They're going to read what's in it. They're going to read and try to understand what's in the beer. Then you have the casual people, the people who have never seen a magic show in their life, have never drank a beer from this company in the world. What is the thing that they are going to look for when they go to drink a craft beer? The label. What is on the label? What is the imaging? What is the logoing? How cool does it look? Is it fun? If I see a fun logo, I'm like, this is going to be a bright, this is going to be a nice light beer. But if I see, you know, dark and it's called, you know, the the devil's warehouse, I know it's probably going to be, uh, it's going to be a dark, uh, heavy stout beer. So it's amazing that it's kind of like your branding on your website. If you come off as authentic and you want to be vibrant and fun and for adults, then you know, make sure people know that from the start because they don't know anything about magic. You have to tell them. You have to tell them what you're going to do with your magic. So if you're a bizarre magic, <laughs> you know, you don't want to put out a nice smiling photo and then show up to a kid's party and you're sticking needles through your arms and, and shooting blood everywhere. So it's all about, and I think beer is just like a great way of, of seeing that. 
I'm a well, be, yeah, beer and pro wrestling. I mean, if you look at a pro wrestler too, and I know you're a little, you have a little bit of fandom in pro wrestling too. <laughs> you're like mild, just, just um, a little bit. But I always love to see how a pro wrestler, like some of the better ones, say a Jericho, will repackage themselves, reinvent based on how their character is perceiving themselves in the ring. Like, are they the bad guy or the good guy? And are they edgy? Are they old school? Are they lucha libre? Are they, you know, all those sorts of things? And those that has to be translated in the style of the graphics you know, the lingo, the catchphrases and everything. That's why I'm very much Grimazing level seven wizard. And it has the two, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. I commit to the bit. Co- commit to the bit. So let's talk about six easy ways to be more authentic in your messaging. Um, and did you want to start this off? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. So, I mean, I think, I think this is mostly, this is messaging. We can look at it from, you know, emails, website promos. I think people like we've talked about, I think it all, it all layers down and people want to get to know you. So share, you know, share an anecdote or share, uh, you know, how you've solved a common problem or even like another one. These are two, but they kind of go together. Show behind the scenes photo, show your authentic self. I've written some emails where it starts with, I'm just, I'm sharing a story. I'm sharing when I got when I, when I got my dog, I announced that I just got a puppy and it was the most exciting thing that had happened to me since I hit my 100th virtual show, which what that also just happened and now it's brand new. How convenient is that? And I shared photos of, uh, of the dog and it's just people just be, show that authentic and fun side of yourself. You, or if you're a serious performer, be serious, share a, share a serious story, but everything doesn't have to just be, you know, sell, 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 sell. And I don't want to. I don't want to answer all they said. I think I'm gonna. I'm gonna answer this one. I know you for sure. Definitely have some more on this. But answering their questions up front, uh, not just bragging about yourself or even asking your own questions. I think you can actually talk more about that one because I know you are you are the expert of that one, and I can. I have some things as well. Yeah. So I think um, those are both really incredible. But answering questions up front or trying to solve um, a common problem. You brought up a great one right at the start of this podcast. Hey, do you have? new hires at your team and you want to come up with a fun way to make them connect. I have an amazing 25 minute show that we can all get together on zoom, see each other. Plus it's highly interactive. And when I mean highly interactive, that means I'm going to have you and your team members on the screen and I'm going to be asking them questions where we learn things about their pets, their home life, their hobbies, you know, that water cooler chat that we don't get to experience and hear that conversation just about all the value that was for say a potential client in a team, that person, I know for a fact those that's what everyone is looking for. That's the, what we need to solve. And there wasn't much about like, I have been on TV some X, Y, and Z amount of times. I do a death defying stunt with these spikes and this dangerous thing, you know? It's about, hey, person that probably needs something solved, I have a quick solution for you here. And also, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, you, you, you first. And then also I try to like sling in there afterwards. I might go to bullet points or provide a PDF document that then is like your FAQ. And from experience, I think this only comes from experience as people ask and send an email, each time you interact with a client, it's a learning experience and you want to make the next experience simpler. So if they had a question that was like, Hey, why, how does this work for your thing? Just throw that into a little document, make it a a common conversation so if someone is concerned hey do you have any questions here you go because the whole thing in this process all we want to do is how do we get to the yes the book we just want to perform the fastest you know yeah and i will say that as someone who's worked uh used to work in a corporate office and now has performed for a ton of corporate offices that that nugget you gave there about writing down and and making an faq based on what people said is gold because the offices change but the culture and the, the way that the, at the core that most of them operate is so eerily similar that it, it's it's kind of scary and uh going back to it also just relaying back about the whole thing about you know these are great tips on how to market but also remember this isn't just buzzwords you're not just putting out there this show is going to be interactive this show is going to connect people and then you don't do anything interactive or connect people at all just you're not just putting buzzwords because you like that google finds you when you put them no you actually have to do that like my whole show my whole show basically i lean into the fact uh that even 18 months into this there are still magicians who think you cannot connect with an audience through a screen uh, and that's their that's their decision. That's totally <laughs> fine. I'm I'm not gonna not gonna yell at them. But my whole show is based on the fact that I have peers who think you can't do this. So I am out here to prove them wrong and show you that we can still have fun. And also, you know, everyone here, you know, you had a Zoom happy hour. Uh, this is this is a perfect segue into you know responding to something they said. 
is another great tip. Uh, it seems so basic, but if you were just sending out a boilerplate email response uh, that completely ignores everything they said, you're going to sound like you weren't listening to them. So if they come to you and they say, you know what, I heard about the show and uh, virtual happy hour. We had one at the beginning of the pandemic. It was so awkward. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew what to say. Well, then respond to them. Let them know, you know, you know, virtual happy hours, they, they're they tough because you're trying to take something that was uh, was built outside or used to do outside the virtual space and put it in the virtual space. I've done something completely different. I've built this for the virtual space. I've found the points and found the ways that people need to connect. I lead the show. There is no awkward moments. I help you understand how to get by in this virtual environment. I help you connect. You're going to interact. I solve all, all these issues. You want to just show them the problems that you're solving and respond to them. Let them know. I hear you. Here's how I can solve it. This is also an incredible tool to go through this process, by the way, of answering all these problems and questions and going through an FAQ. Magicians always talk about niching down. And I think we get stuck in, okay, I have a, this show, it's titled this, and it's for, uh, I think, weddings. But that's not really the, the solution, right? The problem is that we take magic to weddings, and we might have multiple solutions to that, you know? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when you niche down, you answer all these questions for like a virtual magic show. I mean, I have tons of virtual magic tricks. I don't have a set... I kind of improv it and jazz it and everything like this. I have an idea, you know what I mean? However, um, when you niche down, you're kind of like, here's my target audience. Here's the common problems I want to solve. And that's kind of helping you, you as a entrepreneur and a magician to figure out like, oh yeah, this is the service that I offer. And then when it comes to the price of that service that you're offering, you can look at all those things that you answered, all these problems and questions, and you can come up with a clear price and realize, ooh, I've been underselling myself. Or like, okay, little overvalued, little overvalued <laughs> in this, in this market, maybe, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And going back to the, like, I'm just, it made me think about the, the new hires too. It's like, if you think about it, I had a new hire yesterday. So it was fresh on my mind <laughs> and I, I picked, I picked the girl the, for the first trick I did. And, and I was like, Oh, so how long have you been in the company? You know, cause I like to have conversations. I, my, my joke is it's, it's not Netflix. I talk back. <laughs> um, and I like to have conversations and she's like, Oh, I just started today. So most people might think, uh, you know, if you read the room and she seems nervous or uncomfortable, you, you don't get her involved, but she seemed fun and bubbly. So she kind of became the star of the show where there was callbacks. There was things like this. She was brought up. We had her on the grid view with everyone else. At the end of the day, it felt like she was part of a company that, that she had been there for a day. So if you can tell people, here's an example. I, I, I had a new hire too. Uh, here's a story about, here's two sentences of how, how I helped her feel like she was part of the company within one day. That, that is the stuff that people want to hear. They don't. They don't want to. They assume that it's going to be a high quality show. You know. You know. That's. Those are the things that are the basics that you shouldn't have to tell people. It's. It's what, how you can go above the basics that's going to set you apart. It seems like some sort of throwaway common thing to ask someone. Hey, uh, Stephanie, on the other end of the line there. Do you have pets at home? Oh yeah. Okay. How many pets do you have? You have a lizard? No. What's the lizard's name? And that seems so throwaway. But if you are there with a, co a company team, that whole team is very well, so much listening to what they're saying. These conversations are, are missed during these virtual things. It's such a gift to offer those things. Yep. And if they have a dog, they have to obviously pay the dog tax. And I'm sure everyone knows what the dog tax is. When you have a dog, you must bring the dog onto the screen. And that is non-negotiable. Even if Henry, the dog I met two weeks ago, was wearing a diaper, non-negotiable, Henry must be on the screen. See how much fun that is? Oh, man, that's so good. Another thing here about being authentic, too, is having fun subject lines in your email copy. And if you were to go to, and this is more in even beyond email copy on your business cards, on all your advertising, fun headlines and catchphrases. If you were to check out my website, grimazing.com, you'll see how I love to take fun of this. The headline, my H1 that I'm using right now, is um, ooh, Southern Ontario's event magician. So that's how it'd be Googled. However, <laughs> yeah, you'll get an animated cross out and it says wizard. So when you're visiting it, it says wizard. And that's the kind of fun that I like to have. And I always tease that I'm a level seven wizard. And the way, I, I mean, you can hear it in my voice that I don't even believe, believe it. Well, I believe it. At the it same time, you can feel way. you believe it. You believe it, but you're in on the joke. And that, I yeah. think that authentic, authenticity, I could say that word, mm -hmm. comes from just how long and just modify. I mean, you, you'll admit, you've mentioned it before, This the level seven wizard thing did not, was not, I, you didn't immediately do it and it was all of a sudden clicked. It's taken some time and it's taken some some commitment to the bit and figuring out what works for you, right? Even Well, even Ryan was like, if you're going down this path, not using your normal name, you're in an uphill battle. But when you get 
when you start getting there, it's going to be really great. <laughs> well, it must be nice for Ryan Joyce to have such a nice, easy Ryan Joyce. But I, I was Matt Zatkowski, then I went to I went to Matt Zap, and it might be time for Matt Mazing because even with the shortening, that S throws people off. But that's a totally, totally different discussion. I'm totally into the Matt Zat. You know, so for me, real name Graham Reed, right? My middle name is Wilfred. So mm. I feel like when I'm, you know, if I ever start to actually age and not look so young and if i could ever grow a beard same then i would have a cool mind reading name wilfred 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 reed it's my dad's it is nice it's very i feel like your accent doesn't fit that right but that is that is that is pretty good i'll have and to I, smoke some cigars to get there i think yeah i was thinking cigars maybe some pipes but like yeah like i said um and then the last thing i think and we've been really spitballing this whole thing is be yourself but not the marketing robot version of yourself and i've done maybe not paid marketing courses, but things like, you know, downloadable PDFs, documents, all sorts of research in this realm of e-marketing and all this. I always go back to, I think I'm just going to write it my way, um, with a with more of a flow of problem, um, benefit, little review to back it up, and then some fun at the bottom or something, a more explanation kind of thing. But there's so many things out there that struck make you seem like... <laughs> You should structure it like a robot and talk in weird, horrible language. Or, or sometimes we even get emails from people, and I don't know if they ever see their own emails or they've ever compared them to other ones, but the writing style is the exact same. The, the, you know, the catch, the fun zinger words they use are the exact same. They're not diversifying what they're doing. And every word is bolded the same. Yeah, I, I feel like I don't, I don't want this to come off as me saying, you know, marketing classes and marketing funnels don't work because that's absolutely not true at all. They do very much right. so. But what bothers me the most is when you can clearly tell that two people have gone to the exact same whatever seminar it was, especially during the pandemic, when apparently everybody either became a life coach or a marketing coach. And um, you all go to the same seminar and we see it. And I'm just it just it just lacks the authenticity. And that's not to say that there's still people um, that it's not going to work on. But I just feel like some people see this and they're just going to scroll by. I, I look at it as like there's there's some emails and I just, I see the name and I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to scroll past that. Cause I know exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be some, some big fake anecdote at the top. And then some, a lot of bold things. And then I'm just going to be hard sold on something. So it's just, if that's, a, if that's authentic to you, I guess we can't say that, but just kind of taking the learnings, but not the templates or not the exact templates is probably the best suggestion I could give. I think the most related, and this might, I don't even know if this is relatable to our entire listening audience based on the age group that we sometimes hear feedback from, but I remember when you'd see an infomercial on TV, it had a look and a style, and you automatically felt like, ooh, I'm excited to see this carnival ruse, you know? And I think it's the same thing with some of these marketing emails. When you see a certain pay now button, like it has that yellow, orange gradient and a certain font on it, you're like, they're stealing my information. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think because I think because our generation grew up with, you know, you stayed up past your bedtime and those infomercials came on. We're kind of uh, we're, we're we're aware of what's going on. But it's funny because, you know, there are still some people I, I use this analogy a lot. People watch reality shows all the time. Let's say you're watching uh, like a home renovation show and they're going to meet the family and, and the <laughs> renovator walks in the front door. But there's already a camera inside the house getting the shot of the of the renovator coming in the door. But these two, the renovator and the person who owns the house, are pretending like they're meeting for the first time. And there's some people who will realize, oh, wait, they must have met beforehand and because uh, there's a camera inside the house and they're mic'd up. But there's other people who kind of kind of gloss over it and they, they kind of blur reality and they see, oh, okay, maybe this could work. And that's kind of like what I think about with these these marketing tips and the templates. They're going to work on some people. People won't, won't see won't see through it and they'll, they'll just, they'll fall right into it. But you know, if you really want the most of it, you have to, to be authentic and, and be, be more realistic to people. So they, they want to engage with you. They want to see you and they don't want to just, you know, fall for a trap. Don't look at it as a trap. It's just you connecting with people as opposed to just marketing to them. So yeah, I know you, you had actually, before we kind of made notes for this, you threw me some notes and you have some great tips specifically on how you structure emails for vanishing ink. Yeah, I mean, and, it's myself and, and Vanishing Ink. Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely jump into that. So yeah, if you, uh, uh, you know, we have a team that works on them, but you guarantee you if you've subscribed to Vanishing Ink or you're a Vanishing Ink customer, you've seen an email that has been written by me 
uh, on multiple times. And uh, well, one we've already talked about, so we won't get into too much. It's just uh, this is for more for outbound or responding emails. Is to answer the questions up front. We've you know we've we've talked a lot about that. Don't don't miss the questions. But I think the the biggest thing that a lot of people do uh, is they get. They get so into just putting all the things at the top that they bury the lead. And basically, just for anyone who doesn't know what that means, the key part of the story or what you're trying to tell, this is this works for blogs, this works for articles, this works for emails, is buried too low. Uh, people should know what you're talking about within the first two, three paragraphs. And I'm not just talking the subject line. I'm talking the core of the message. So I, I share a quick example about... I would say about almost a year ago now, I went to send out an email because you know uh, it was getting towards the September, virtual shows had kind of slowed down. And I wanted to send out an email to people saying that I have a brand new virtual show. And I, I actually went on and I, I found some, you know, I was learning some templates and I shared a story and I shared this, that, and the other thing. Send the email out. I thought it was great. It had it had a GIF, which is the correct, uh, the correct pronunciation. It had a GIF in it. Had this, all that. Had a story. I was this great, great subject line. Yeah, yeah. Terrible open rate. So I used I used uh, Mailchimp on this one. Terrible open rate. Terrible clicks. I'm like, what is going on? Well, I realized the genius and me waited till the absolute last sentence to tell everybody that it was a new virtual magic show. And what's the issue here? Well, I was sending it to people that had already seen my virtual magic show. So what I should have told them up front was that everything I'm telling you about is brand new. It's stuff that you have not seen. I put that in the final paragraph, so people didn't even get to that point. They didn't read down that point, didn't see it was new, and decided, oh, I've seen the show. I have no reason to to click or do it. So I completely buried the lead and wasted a lot of time on an email that probably could have done very well if I brought the most important stuff up to the top. And then, uh, and I will keep going. We have, so we have, like I said, photos, GIFs, make it exciting. Now, you know, you don't have to always use it, but just a wall of text is hard for people. Like I said before, someone who's, who's like me who has ADHD, it's hard to bounce your eyes over a big wall of text. So make it exciting, make it fun, make it things that people uh, want to read. And this one we've talked about, I know you are a big proponent of it, is to get, uh, this is more for when you're responding and, and answering people, get as much as you can and as few emails as possible. Email should be concise and have everything that someone needs. You don't want to get back in a thread and then someone forwards it to somebody and then they reply and then you're trying to find responses and everything. You want to keep everything uh, uh, tight. And I, I don't know, do you have a, uh, do you have like a, a set limit on yourself? Like how many emails you want to close, uh, close a show with? Oh, I think, I mean, I'll have a yes or no pretty quick um, with the amount of emails that I send. But the, I think the email strategy I have is if someone has a question for me and if I have to make sure that I'm going to really think about it, do I have a question for them? Got to really think about those questions. And then if they haven't answered my questions, I'm going to, I think I've seen this in corporate culture a lot. It's common etiquette to go like question number one and do a bullet point form list. Boom, boom, boom. And sometimes people take the time to respond and they'll put their answers in a different color for each question, which is phenomenal. So I kind of have matched that and spin the whole thing back. Right. Um, so I, I find, I've never had anything, if I don't hear a response back, I guess, I think that's when something goes cold for me. It's like they haven't responded to me in X amount of days. You know, I'll go through the pattern. Okay, it's it's been a week. I'm going to respond again. Hey, what's up? Don't so, hear anything, um, you know, then maybe two weeks and then I'll leave them alone. And I know you're a big fan of uh, of, of Tim Hannig's book, Performing. He talks about that too, that, you know, a lead doesn't ever definitely go cold so you said about a week uh and you said maybe a month again you'll follow up what about what about down the line will you ever follow up with someone four or five months just hey checking in oh yeah i do those things so if i've done a you know if i've done events for pe people in the past or things like that because i use one of those booking i use a gigio booking software which mm -hmm. keeps everything well organized for me um and so with that i can help it helps me with those marketing emails to keep that all on track about like hey you did this last year would you like to do this again just thinking of you kind of thing. Yeah. But, and then I also make that email super personal. Um, I think I, I would say I learned this from the Evisons. And I think I've learned this through them through just conversation. They have a really great database of information on everybody they've met and keep little notes um, and conversational things that you can have. So if you can remember things after the show that you say it's a great client, you did an amazing you know, backyard corporate thing that gave you barbecue lobster afterwards. Oh my goodness, all these cake... And like they tipped you incredibly well, you're like, gotta make sure I do this one again. 
um, yeah. write down, have a little notebook or something, but write down notes as fast as you can before you can get in a computer software database of like some, some important details. Remember those names? Remember their pet names? Those sorts of things? That's going to go a very long way. That is a, a absolute gold tip. Absolute gold. And I, I like you mentioned the follow up. Like my my uh, when I ask people politely to write a review, I don't want to just send out an automatic email that says, you know, um, can you write a review for me, please? Thanks for a great show. I mean, during the heat of uh, of virtual uh, holiday season, I kind of had to rely on that a little bit. But uh, when when it's things are a little bit uh, more manageable, I like to send out a, a screenshot if I have it. Uh, mentioned something like yesterday i was like oh you know thanks to uh thanks to tim for being such a such a great sport uh when we were bringing him up on screen all the time i like to to mention that so that's a that's a great tip you can go back and understanding i you know i uh, have you had any of the barbecues since i last saw you you know was the sandwich as good as it looked that's that's great it shows it shows that you care and i think that is so important you're not just there to be i'm magic man or i'm uh, I'm, I'm amazing. I'm this, that, you know, I actually care about giving you an experience, not just showing you some tricks. And I it's think about, those little things. It's about removing your ego from the situation. That's kind of the underlying thing about being authentic, right? You're not kind of like, oh, hey, did you see that I was on this TV show? Or by the way, I have this new hit show that I do this kind of thing. And like, by the way, um, you know, this year has been really difficult. And I wonder if your team has been connecting virtually because I have this um, cool show that helps us connect. Yeah, I don't know that other stuff that we already talked about. It's about you know, it's thinking ahead, planning ahead sort of thing. So while we're still, we were kind of kicking around the email topic, we should close up a call to the CTA, the call to action, because a lot of people get hung up or stuck on call to actions. Do you have some, some good advice on, on. Yeah. I, I think, I think you, you touched on it too, because when you remove your ego and, and you remove it from you just doing magic tricks, you realize that you, you're offering something to somebody and that, that is, you want to give it to them. So what is your goal? Don't just go out emailing people saying your goal is not to tell people that you have a new show. That's not that's not your goal. They expect they know you're a magician. They know you offer magic services. That's that's not that's not your goal. Your goal is like you said is is to connect. You have you have new hires. I can help them make feel like they've been with the company for all this time. And then, you know, what is what is your call to action? How are you ending that email? Is it uh, for some people I like to personally um on the first email, I always I don't like to just email. I like to get people on the phone. The call to action was, you know, I, I've given you a lot here, but let's let's plan a let's plan a uh, a time to a time to speak or a time to chat. Or if it's on your website, uh, on your website, the the call to action there is people either need to learn more, or book you. So make sure that that is that is clear, that is concise. You have an easy way for people to to know what they're doing. If they read this and they go, I want a book, then there should be a book now button right there, right next to it. They should know, okay, I'm here. Here's how I get in touch with the person. So make sure you have a goal and then you have a clear way for someone to to achieve that goal. There's there's a clear, you're not ending an email with a, with a question, uh, you know, things up in the air. People know what's happening and, and how they can make it happen. It's kind of, it's the end result, the solution to the problem. How do we solve this whatever thing that we've just discussed in this email or, or pitch that I've sent you? Before we wrap up, I just kind of want to leave some people with some frameworks and things to think about. Um, and I think this helps with the writing because I think when we get in this marketing space and I've fallen into this, we start to do too many benefits, too many solve too many solutions. And I mentioned it before about niching down and this has helped me a lot recently too. So if you think about the corporate event, what is the true objective? Is the true objective for you to be absolutely amazing or is it to actually have all the attendees thank the coordinator event coordinator thank the special guest like were there some other i always see it as a video game there's a checklist of things that you want to achieve to get maximum points in tony hawk you know what i mean <laughs> um or in restaurant magic i always i always sold it as oh do you have long wait times do you have a busy restaurant blah 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 and i think that's like the low level way to look at restaurant magic however the higher way to look at it would be do you want to create a maximum impact experience? Like I see you have an amazing restaurant here. Do you want to like heighten that experience even more with, you know, some high level magic table side? And even that concept has a higher price value to it. And then we've already talked about it too. You bring the, you brought this up throughout the episode, virtual magic. Is it about the cool cameras and the editing software or the virtual magic, the fact you can do magic over the internet, or is it the fact that you can connect a team 
and learn about all these people that are connecting from all over the world. Yeah, and I would say to you, you've mentioned this a lot, and I really think it's just a great piece of wisdom. If you don't know, let's let's say you know a lot of people haven't done a bazillion virtual shows, and that's totally fine. If you don't know, when you're speaking with people, why don't you ask them? Ask them what is when they come to you and they say, you know, uh, I really just I didn't like the virtual happy hour we did. We did virtual trivia. Ask them why they didn't like it. Ask them what about it did they did they not like it? Was it was and they they might tell you, you know, it was awkward or or it didn't feel very engaging or fun. You can ask them. Ask people. Talk to friends. See what they don't like about. Figure out some of these problems that you can solve. You don't have to do it all on your own. I mean, a lot of the things we've talked about, we've learned from doing all these shows. We didn't know it when we first started. So kind of, I, I think your tip about, my biggest takeaway is your tip about, you know, not just answering questions, but not being afraid to, to ask questions and, and, and find ways to answer those. And the unique thing too about asking questions is um, we know this from doing performing magic. You get common answers. There's so many common answers. People are, we're all the same, you know? I mean, that's a broad state, super broad statement, but we all share a lot of the same experiences and a lot of the same problems. So, you know, there's so much way, so many ways to connect. And because we're in the world of magic and asking people so many questions, take their answers. When you're talking to the next client, you go, oh, by the way, have you ever experienced this problem? And then you're a total pro and they're in solving their problem now. Like, look at that. You're just learning as you go. Um, as we wrap up this episode, Matt, this has been a really good conversation. I feel like we could do a part two and almost go for like three hours on this. <laughs> yeah. I know. I definitely agree. It's been awesome. I really appreciate you having me. Um, so plugs, talking about things, the way that you can support the podcast, uh, join our discord. If you actually want to learn more about this, you can reach out to, I know Matt, you're on there. I don't know how open you are to taking DMS for other people on the discord, but if you want you to talk slide right into my DMS, I'm okay. okay with it. Cool. We try to treat our discord as a safe place. Ryan and I don't spend too much time on other social media. However, if you ever want to reach out to us and talk magic, the discord is the place to do that. Plus, you can join into fun things like the book club or potentially be a guest host on the podcast like Matt Zat. You can also watch these episodes on YouTube. And if you've been watching us, thank you so much for watching this episode on YouTube. Also get some merch, not this. This is from WWE. They don't need any more support. Um, but you can grab some of our merch from Redbubble. I got some of the pins on my laptop bag just over there. Look at that. Um, and Matt, do you have anything that you want to plug? Any, anything else you want to shill on our podcast? I mean, yeah, I love shilling. Uh, yeah, reach out. I'm on the Discord. The Discord's fun. You, you, look at it. You're, you're helping me get into all these things. My first magic convention was last year. My first Discord was the Magicians Talking Magic Discord. I'm, I'm learning all these things on the go. I guess I'm kind of an old man. But also, uh, yeah, you can come see me. I'm mostly on the, the Vanishing Ink stuff, but I have my own Instagram. You can come say hi. But mostly, um, we're doing some fun stuff. If you are going to magi fest this year i look forward to seeing you come say hi we're gonna be uh we're gonna be posting up some things hiding some things where if you come find me and, and show me a trick you might win some fun stuff so come see me uh i'll be easy to spot i'll be wearing a shirt come say hi i want to meet some people uh, i'm excited to to get back out you know do it safely but also just just see some people see some magic again you know uh, not seeing friends you know it feels like the creative juices sometimes can, can can get stalled so i know every time every time after hanging out with some magic friends i'm, I'm feeling great and feeling creative so i'm excited cool awesome matt thanks so much for being here and thank you so much for listening to this episode shoblasm to doozle We did it. We did it.